In this video, we're looking at the MIST FPGA computer. What is it? The MIST FPGA computer is a hardware programmable computer and by loading different cores can be configured to replicate in hardware classic home computers such as the Atari ST, Commodore 64 or Commodore Amiga. The MIST FPGA, however, can also replicate in hardware classic home consoles like the Atari, Nintendo, Sega and many others. This video is the first part of a whole series of videos about the MIST FPGA computer. The plan is to make tutorials and guides that show you how to use the MIST as well as recordings of games and demos so you can compare them with the real thing. I will put the videos into your playlist so it should be easy to find and navigate them. At first the MIST FPGA computer seems a little bit expensive. It sells for around 200 euros. But once you understand what hardware programming actually means, the MIST is actually extremely good value. You can currently purchase the MIST FPGA computer from stores in Germany, Poland and also Spain. I will go into more detail about the MIST in the next video. However, I'm going to explain so much you can connect standard peripherals such as a VGA monitor, USB keyboards, USB mice and USB gamepads. The MIST is also USB powered, extremely energy efficient and you can load cores, firmware and games through a SD card reader. There's a stereo headphone jack which lets you connect speakers for audio output. To really get excited about the MIST and not confuse it with a software emulator, I have prepared a little presentation that hopefully explains much better what our FPGA computer actually is. Ok, welcome to my PowerPoint about the MIST FPGA computer. The whole idea is to get you just excited as I am, because I believe once you understand what FPGA computing is all about, uh, you will become a lot more excited and interested in the MIST FPGA computer. So let's start with a practical scenario. We've got two workers and a metal sheet press or metal sheet bending machine. Uh, he pushes the button to activate the machine and he inserts the sheets of metal. So he proceeds, puts in some sheet, sheet, sheets of metal into the machine and unfortunately this worker was distracted and pushes the button while that worker still has his hands in the machine and unfortunately an accident. So to avoid this in the future, management says from now on both workers need to push a button at the same time to activate the sheet press machine. So how can we do this? We can use a computer and write a software program. So here we have a software program. We have two buttons. What does the program says? say? It says if button 1 is pressed and button 2 is pressed at the same time, activate the sheet press, otherwise do nothing. Stick the whole thing into a repeat forever loop and the program will do this over and over and over and over. So this is a traditional computer and the software is programmed. Let's make it a little bit more complex. Let's say they're expanding and they've got three sheet pressing bending machines. So we've got uh, two workers each with working on button one and button two, and another pair of workers on button three and four, and a third pair of workers on button five and six. So this is what the program looks like. One computer controls all three machines and all the buttons. So it says if button one and two are pressed, activate the uh, sheet press, I should say number one, that's a different one. If button 3 and 4 are pressed, activate another sheet press and if button 5 and 6 are pressed, also activate a sheet press. And the problem you see now is, if the computer, the computer processes this line by line. So let's say he's at this stage. If button 1 and button 2 are pressed, um, do the following. Now what happens if suddenly two people press uh, button 5 and 6? At the moment, nothing. They have to wait until the program gets all the way down to here. And that's the downside of uh, software. And especially with emulators, and that's why you see really authentic emulators needing uh, fairly beefy, powerful computers, just so that they can process this loop fast enough so everything seems like it's happening at the same time. So let's go to the next page. So that's what programming looks like. Uh, the program checks button one and two, then button three and four, then button five and six. So while it's doing this, these two are not really checked. So it goes around in a circle and checks one thing at a time. So we've got this here, one thing at a time. Traditional computer. Okay, let's build a hardware circuit. So management realized that the software solution is not good enough. They want the buttons to be tested all the time. So they're coming up with a simple hardware circuit. They're using an AND gate. So an AND gate is just an electrical circuit. If button 1 and 2 are pressed, this will go to high and therefore the machine will operate. And let's make it again more complex. Let's say we have three 
Uh, okay, in this case, that didn't make sense. I should have had three machines here, but it doesn't really matter. I've got three pair of workers, and if they, those two press a button, this end gate will become true, so the machine will turn on. If these two press a button, this end gate will become true and the machine will run. And if the, these two press the two buttons simultaneously, the end gate will also set the output to true and the machine will turn on. So what these two people do is totally independent of them. There is no, this is going to get processed first and then that one and then this one. All of these buttons get monitored um, in, in, in parallel, in real time, so to speak. So by building a hardware circuit, many things happen in parallel. There is no waiting for something to finish like with a traditional computer. And that's where we come in with the FPGA. With the FPGA, you can program in hardware. So we've got an example here. The Altera Cyclone 4 is basically an FPGA chip and it's got logic blocks which you can program. So this is what the FPGA looks like and you basically write a little uh, software, a, like a, a schematic or a program, yeah, and you upload it into the FPGA and you say, well, there's an input here, there's another input there, let's have an end gate there and let's make the output over here and boom, you have the same circuit that we had before in this slide, however, in the FPGA. And through software, you can now change the configuration of this FPGA. So you're basically writing um, the hardware circuit and uploading it into the FPGA. And that is the huge benefit compared to um, having a software program. So many things happen in parallel. There's no waiting for something to finish, like with a traditional computer. The hardware is programmable. Want it to do something else, just upload a new program. And in an FPGA, what you see, for example, is that the commodity is the area. So for example, you might have one, one area, uh, one section allocated for the sound, and you've got another section allocated um, for the graphics chip, another section that does input and output controls here. Yeah? So it's not reliant on processing power like the software emulator. Let's see what else we got. Yep, so we go back to the question, what is, uh, what is the missed FPGA computer? That's what it looks like. I opened the panel. It's USB powered. It's got four USB ports where you can plug in keyboard, mice, gamepads, joysticks, and so on. It's got an SD card reader in the front that allows, allows you to flash the firmware, load cores. A core is basically, there's a core for the Amiga, there's a core for the Commodore 64, there's a core for the Atari ST, and so on. Um, and also the games, of course. It's got an audio output. Um, it does have analog ports for old school joysticks, like the Commodore 64 or uh, Atari joysticks. And FPGA can be programmed to turn this computer into a hardware equivalent home computer or console such as Amiga, Atari ST, Commodore 64, Atari 2600, NES, and many, many others. And there you have it. So hopefully you are a little bit more excited, or at least you know a little bit more about what an FPGA computer is and how it's how it's different compared to uh, emulation. Because a lot of people might go, well, hey, hang on a minute. I can just get a Raspberry Pi 2. Um, and I've got an emulator, main, run all my uh, Amiga emulators and Commodore 64 emulators. I've got the same thing. It's like, well, no, you actually don't. Because there's a big difference between uh, emulating in software and replicating the original hardware in hardware. It's all to do with the timings and being able to process things in, in parallel and not having to wait for one task to finish before you can do another task. I'm really excited looking forward into the future, like how this develops over the next five or 10 years. FPGA chips, there are bigger, more powerful chips available already, but the prices are a little bit high. But give it a bit of time and these chips will become available uh, to consumers. So the possibilities are really uh, endless, to be honest. At the moment, um, you can the highest you can go is, is uh, simulate an Amiga 1200 with the AGA uh, chipset and that's a quite a powerful machine so it won't take long until we can uh, probably replicate some more advanced systems in hardware so that's a really cool thing. To come back to the price 200 euros seems a lot of money but when you look at the prices for getting like a real Amiga or Commodore 64 they are quite steep they're not cheap um, I'm pretty sure you can spend a lot more than 200 euros on just a single 
fully pimped out Amiga setup, you know, like with the monitor and then you need a memory upgrade and you need to fix your clock and uh, the keyboard might be buggy. So I've seen Kickstarter projects where you can get new keys and new cases uh, and all sorts of things. So before you know it, uh, you're spending just as much. So if you like something simple and you like the idea of uh, being able to uh, just switch from one machine uh, to the other, then look, the Mist FPGA computer is really, really awesome. And that's it for this video. Going forward in the next video, what can you expect? I definitely want to provide a more detailed overview of all the plugs and ports and how you uh, set it all up. And we're going to configure the uh, Mist with an Amiga 500 configuration and download a free, uh, a couple of free games and just have it set up and up and running for the first time. Please subscribe to my channel. Share this video with your friends via Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus or Reddit. Hit that like button and if you've got any comments or questions, just leave them down below. I'm always eager to hear from you.